Buenas a todos ustedes, estimados colegas, amistades. Es un gran placer estar aquí con ustedes. Uh, good afternoon, I'm uh, Augie Gallego. Um, as chair of the San Diego Dialogue, again, it is a pleasure to welcome all of you to this Forum Fronterizo event. This is the first Forum Fronterizo in two years, and we have uh, brought you together to be part of an exciting program today. As many of you know, the Forum Fronterizo Luncheon Series was established to provide civic leaders with a venue to examine opportunities and challenges in the San Diego, Baja California metropolitan region. Today's program will continue this tradition. Good afternoon, I'm Mary Walshock from UCSD and the San Diego Dialogue. And my opportunity is to set the stage for what should be a very, very lively discussion uh, led by Bob Kittle with some very important players in the cross-border region. But first of all, I'm going to share with you the results of what was a year and a half study conducted by the San Diego Dialogue focused on understanding the opportunities for globally traded companies growing in partnership in the cross-border region. And I'm going to quickly go through some slides. We have reports available in the foyer for any of you who want them. They're also available on the web in English and Spanish. I'd also like to acknowledge before speed reading these uh, slides with you that Sandag in parallel has done an extraordinary report on the implications of border weights for the economy of both Baja California and San Diego, San Diego in particular. And when you take these two reports together, we see uh, a, a set of opportunities that are unparalleled in any border region in the world, but we also see a set of challenges. I mentioned that there are two studies of the unknown synergies and untapped potential in the cross-border region that I commend to all of you. The first is our own study on borderless innovation, wherein we identify globally competitive, high value added industries and jobs in the cross-border region. The second is Sandag's recent cross-border study which there was one slide in their presentation, and you can get that study today, that just knocked my socks off. Uh, this was commissioned with an outside economist who estimated that the two and a half hour waits at the border for the truck crossings are equivalent in jobs and revenues lost to eight Qualcomm's in San Diego County. And that drove home for us the importance of addressing the issue of cross-border infrastructure. The cross-border region has the potential to be a global hub in strategic arenas. The data that's contained in these two reports points out four very important things that were emphasized in the panels this morning. The first is that there are high quality manufacturing facilities as well as globally competitive R&D facilities on both sides of the border. More and more of the maquillas and suppliers in Mexico as well as in San Diego conform to international standards and have the potential to be um, global manufacturers and distributors immediately. There are also many more potential synergies in the cross-border region than any of us realized. Certainly in the area of clinical research, which our panelists from Merck uh, talked about this morning, but also in environmental technologies and in telecom. Another piece of data that came out of our research that even the university people in San Diego had trouble uh, uh, accepting at first is what a large science and technology labor pool is being developed uh, in the cross-border region because of the uh, uh, growth of the universities across Baja and the large numbers of engineering and computer science graduates coming from all these universities. 
And finally, we were able to identify, both in the Sandag report and in the uh, dialogue report, that there already are many, many cross-border technology partnerships, both in R&D, manufacturing, and in supplier networks that there are many, many uh, Mexican companies with links to Asia that could be beneficial to San Diego's strategic uh, objectives, as well as uh, the links to manufacturing being potentially uh, valuable to San Diego companies and California companies remaining here. And that the concept we'd like to introduce to you today of near sourcing of working with our neighbors in Baja and Mexico is good for both San Diego and Baja California's competitiveness. And we need to move away from the notion of outsourcing and think more in terms of near sourcing. We'd like to share very, very quickly three slides with some of the data from our report. The first is on biomedical devices. There are actually over 30,000 people working in the biomedical cluster in uh, Baja, California and in uh, San Diego County. 23,000, and our data is from 2003, so we actually estimate it's closer to 25,000 are working in uh, advanced manufacturing firms in Baja, California, and about six or 7,000 are in R&D and manufacturing in San Diego County. Baja California has the highest number of FDA certified biomedical device companies in all of Mexico. And yet our organizations on the US side, like Biocom, Connect, EDC, all wonderful organizations, have not been actively promoting this fact as a competitive advantage to San Diego. Uh, the uh, other thing that I think is very important is that the range of products that are being manufactured in Baja California uh, cover basic components of medical devices, but also very advanced technologies such as heart pumps, stents, pacemakers. There's a lot to be gained there. Aerospace is another area that we think is terribly exciting in terms of a cross-border cluster. There's been significant growth. Today it's only about 5,000 uh, Mexican workers in the aerospace industry, about 18,000 in San Diego. But what we learned again is that Baja California has the highest concentration of aerospace companies in all of Mexico. So this represents a strategic advantage. Mexico is also the ninth largest aerospace supplier to the US. And as those of you who are around this industry know, there are a number of agreements pending so that Mexican firms will be able to manufacture according to US Department of Defense uh, standards. Let me just share our third uh, data slide. And that is about the binational science and technology workforce. The United States is very, very concerned about the pipeline for engineering and science graduates. We in San Diego, Baja California, are blessed with close to 2,300 engineering graduates a year. In fact, if you look at the graduates of UABC, the Autonomous University of Baja California, they're actually graduating more computer sciences, bachelor's degrees in computer science, than either UCSD or SDSU. Kevin Harris spoke today in the panel about the potential synergies in software. This is certainly something to pursue. So what I'd like to leave you with are three recommendations about how the social network and the mutual respect and trust that is represented in this room can move forward and build on this data to actually take some initiatives that would change the region. And I need to begin by saying there are many, many significant and parallel efforts taking place in many organizations. However, they tend to be fragmented. And we are suggesting 
in the Borderless Innovation Report that we need to form new collaboratives, new partnerships, not create new organizations, but create new partnerships between existing organizations to do three things that could transform and really leverage the capability of our binational region. The first is we need more coordinated efforts to link infrastructure development in Baja California with infrastructure development across the state of California with particular emphasis on secure and safe borders as well as efficient borders. We had a fabulous panel this morning where uh, representatives of Caltrans, of IT Squared at UC San Diego talked about how the technology is there. We just need the political will and the investment to take advantage of it. A second set of recommendations we're making quite strongly, and it's not just because I'm at UCSD, but because when you study local economies, you know that when you have research and education focused on regional assets, you can be more competitive. You can attract companies to your region because you have education and training programs that are relevant to their technologies and their management needs. So we feel quite strongly that we need a partnership among universities in Baja and across San Diego focused on cross-border innovation and competitiveness. And that research on industrial and workforce trends and the opportunities in the region needs to be commissioned on an ongoing basis. There needs to be technical assistance provided to managers and firms interested in achieving the cross-border synergies. And most certainly, there needs to be education and training for science, technology, and managerial professionals who are operating in the cross-border context. Our third recommendation, and DATAC and EDC and many organizations have already started this journey, is that there needs to be a truly strategic and comprehensive approach to co-marketing the region through collaboratively developed campaigns, not just a brochure here or a videotape there, but a real campaign that celebrates the assets and the promise of our cross-border region. So these are the ideas that have come out of the Borderless Innovation Report. We urge you to pick up copies or to get on our website and to think about and evaluate whether you, like we, see these, uh, this great potential. Many of you know that the San Diego Dialogue has had a long and rich history in the San Diego uh, Tijuana and Mexicali region, across Baja California. And long before he was governor, Gina Lordway was a supporter and a guide in the San Diego Dialogue. So he really needs no introduction. But we felt it was very appropriate that based on the work that is coming out of Sandag and out of uh, the San Diego Dialogue, he comment on what he thinks the opportunities are and whether we're on target. Since taking office in 2001, uh, Governor Lordway has worked very hard to improve conditions for his state and relations with California. He has been instrumental in leading a transition in focus to high value added industries such as biomedical device and semi semiconductor manufacturing. He has been not only a moral supporter, but an investor in our cross-border research, which has gone on in such a positive manner with our partners in Baja, Centris, and Cicese. Governor Lordway has also built a very positive relationship with Arnold Schwarzenegger, the governor of California. They have met several times and launched a number of new collaborative programs. But for me, and I say this with deep appreciation and respect, Jean, your involvement with the dialogue and your call for us to continue the cross-border efforts after the untimely passing of Chuck Nathanson is greatly appreciated and spurred us on. And I think we're about to take off. So, Governor, please. Good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. It's a 
great pleasure to be with all of you here. If there is a moment in the lives of our region, it is today to set forth our efforts to work together in common goals. I would like to obviously thank Mary for her very, very kind words, undeserving, but very, very kind words. Thank you, Mary. And it's been a pleasure and an honor to work with you and to continue working with you. And uh, I would like to express that what Mary has outlined for us are some of the findings and recommendations from the Borderless Innovation Study. One of the main themes in this study and in many of our border-related meetings is the importance of thinking and working together as a region. In fact, I believe our region is one of borderless opportunities, linked in different ways and with different backgrounds, but with a common destiny. We are, after all, united by our geography, our environment, our families, and our economy. But we are also united in our past and in our future. Let us take a moment to imagine the San Diego, Baja California region in only one decade. In 10 years, there will be over 7 million people in this area. By 2016, the border crossings here between San Diego and Tijuana will somehow have to manage more than 80 million northbound crossings each year, not to mention the border crossings between Calexico and Mexicali. What will our economy look like in 2016? What will our educational systems be like? How will we work together to improve the quality of life for the citizens that will live in this region? Today, the path we will take to the year 2016 is not clear, but we can commit to confront our mutual challenges and to make our borderless opportunities a reality. Within Mexico, my state is already considered a place of opportunity, receiving many families and individuals looking for a way to build a better future. We are in many ways a state of migrants, but we are also a state of pioneers and entrepreneurs, people that are determined to make a better life, to adapt to new environments, new cultures, and to new ways of working, while always respecting our human dignity and human rights. These are, in fact, many of the same characteristics that make California a great state as well. By working together, our region and our two states can use our common background and our common spirit to meet the challenges of the 21st century together. As my good friend Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger and I agreed in a joint statement last fall, we cannot underestimate the importance of our states working together in order to find regional solutions to the challenges we face. Economic prosperity and security in the region depends on close coordination between our states. Government, the private sector, and citizen-based groups all have a role to play. Over the last 20 years, our border region has grown in extraordinary ways. Over the next decade, it will continue to do so. While there have been few efforts to identify the cross-border economic synergies or to formulate joint economic development strategies, the time to do so has arrived. I call for us to work together to create a wide-ranging coalition of interests and organizations that share the goal of cross-border economic development for working together to improve our regional quality of life and for developing an action plan to create an innovation corridor of the Californias stretching across our border region. This region represents an area of great prosperity for both countries and a unique region compared to other borders around the world. San Diego and Baja California 
have the potential to become a global showcase for how two nations can collaborate and grow our technological clusters for the common benefit of our citizens. Clusters such as biomedical devices, the aerospace industries, software, marine technology, biotechnology, pharmaceuticals, and other emerging, emerging opportunities like the semiconductor and automotive industry. Collaborating in economic development not only benefits our economy, it also helps us create trust and cooperation in other areas of our society and helps us become a stronger, more secure region. By rethinking what makes us, what makes up our region, we are forced to also rethink who we are, what unites us, what we share, what advantages we can offer both sides of the border for harmonizing our development and for promoting and consolidating our competitive advantages for decades to come. We have, in fact, a binational region that is different from any other region in the U.S. or Mexico, or even other border regions throughout the world. And we can take advantage of the resources each of our communities can bring. Our citizens have diverse skills and backgrounds. Many of them are multilingual or multicultural. And all of them are trying to understand how to best meet and to adapt to global challenges and global competition with the resources and institutions that our region possesses. We do not best meet these challenges by focusing our energies on building walls to further divide us. Nor can we best meet these challenges by working on common problems without coordination, whether it is education, the environment, the economy, or border security. This last topic, security, is one of growing integration and success with stronger coordination between our states in the exchange of criminal records, which has allowed us to maintain more effective communication and take actions. In recent days in Brownsville, Texas, the Secretaries of Government and Public Safety, Carlos Abascal and Eduardo Medina Mora, as well as the Secretary of Homeland Security, Michael Chertoff, signed an agreement to fight border violence and increase security. This document also establishes the mechanisms for immediate reaction to prevent, pursue, and punish any criminal activities that affect the border cities of both countries. It also includes a variety of mechanisms for each side to coordinate on emergency situations. But while security is a critical foundation to a competitive economy, our shared border is not a threat. It is an opportunity for mutual development. The recent SANDAG study gives us some important insight, estimating that border weights between San Diego and Tijuana currently cause at least $4 billion in lost economic output already. What may be more critical, however, is that SANDAG also estimates that border weights in the decade may cause as much as $10 billion in lost economic output for our region. Working together to avoid this economic threat means economic benefits for our border region and for our states. In addition to security, the environment is also an area where working together can benefit two communities and avoid potential problems. Joint planning for environmental infrastructure opens opportunities for joint financing of the infrastructure that can keep our region competitive. Water, for instance, is one area where our coordination has been lacking. Efforts to go forward with lining the All-American Canal, for instance, put at risk the quality of life of today and future generations. It also impacts the preservation of protected natural species in both countries and also the agricultural activities of a great part of the Valley of Mexicali. The government of Baja California will continue to seek the suspension of the parallel canal project adjacent to the All-American Canal and to seek the reactivation of the binational working group. During our February meeting in, Mexico, in Washington with Tom Shannon, Assistant Secretary for Western Hemispheric Affairs of the Department of State, we emphasized this position and Mexico's President Vicente Fox agreed to discuss this topic as well 
during his upcoming meeting at the end of this month with President Bush. But this example points out the value of planning and working together to solve our common challenges. We avoid misunderstandings and we can find mutual ways to benefit the citizens on both sides of our border. Working together in this way also allows us to focus on the greater challenges that increasing levels of global competition bring to our communities. At this point, Baja California is confronting these challenges by such measures as our creation of an entrepreneurial development policy, working with each of the five cities in our state. Through this policy, we are working to develop and promote 15 industry clusters, including the wine industry, wood furniture, medical services, area special, and automotive, among others. Several of these clusters, in fact, prompted our interest in supporting the efforts of UCSD and the Inter-American Development Bank, together with Centris, CICESE, and the San Diego Dialogue. Their work is summed up in the Borderless Innovation Study, a report that provides a vision of our region as one not just in a binational context, but rather as a binational region in a global context. One that shows how Baja California's efforts to redesign our industry's value chains, to grow the capabilities of our workforce, and to add value to both, is both starting to pay off and can play a role as a partner in an integrated Baja California, San Diego economy. Just last year, 2005, as in 2004, Baja California produced 11% of jobs in all of Mexico and received $2.3 billion in investment. This partnership can also extend beyond San Diego to a Greater California, Baja California Partnership for Prosperity and Competitiveness. Such a model holds the promise of bringing educators, entrepreneurs, innovators, and investors together from the Californias and to attract the world's attention to our two states as well. It was with just such a vision that on June 22 of 2005, we broke ground on the Silicon Border Project near Mexicali. While it is still in its design phase, this high-tech industrial park is being created to attract semiconductor manufacturing to our region for the benefits of not just Baja California, but Imperial County, San Diego, and California as well. For the first phase of investment for Silicon Border will be $100 million with between three and four hundred million dollars of total investment in the next in the next few years and the addition of up to fifty thousand jobs within the next decade many of those engineers designers and technicians the park will also be home to a two hundred acre educational complex for a university research facilities and conferences just recently there was a signature of an agreement with the Autonomous University of Baja California to have that university in that park. As Silicon Border becomes a reality, as we move closer toward creating this innovation cent corridor of the Californias, we can better visualize our true potential as one region in the 21st century. Our ability to develop and utilize the human and natural resources in our region will also allow us to achieve a synergy that we cannot achieve alone and to better compete on the global stage. For me, I will continue to work with Governor Schwarzenegger and our colleagues in the California Legislature on security, education, economic development, and the environment. And I will also continue looking forward to the future towards the year 2016 and towards a region of borderless opportunity and borderless innovation, always keeping in mind our people, the residents of this region, and the constant improvement of their quality of life. I will put all my effort with great conviction in working with all of you around this borderless innovation document, which will give us the guidelines of what we must do Many hours have been put into this document. It is of high quality, and obviously, we must be used as our guideline. I think that with the efforts of all of us, and above all, the conviction of the great importance that we have, that we have right now, 
of this great opportunity, we must show to ourselves and to everybody else that we have the absolute clearness of mind as to what we must do. It is time to start. We have what has been integrated into a guideline of great importance. Let us not just be hearing of what must be done, but let's start doing it as soon as we finish this luncheon. Thank you. Yolanda Benson, let's talk about some of the nuts and bolts here. What is the Schwarzenegger administration doing to address the infrastructure deficits that we have been talking about here that hamper cross-border trade? Uh, and in particular, does his um, large infrastructure bond, which is hopefully going to take shape this week in an agreement with the legislature, uh, what does it do to address some of these infrastructure problems? Well, first, um, working at the Business, Transportation, and Housing Agency, we oversee uh, such departments as Caltrans, so we certainly are working with um, many of our directors throughout the state, including Pedro Orso Delgado, who's been actually at the forefront of working on infrastructure issues right at the border. So he uh, was part of a panel this morning and discussed very much in detail what's being done on that end. But the, the uh, strategic growth plan that the governor envisions in rebuilding California is really about rebuilding for our economy and for business. Right now we spend so much time in traffic congestion, especially in the urban areas where we are unable to really produce what we need to produce. So much of the gridlock is not only on the freeways, it's actually affecting our businesses and how we can be productive. So certainly the $222 billion that are part of the strategic growth plan will certainly help to do that. We hope that any minute now, uh, literally any minute now, we will have uh, some sort of understanding in working with the legislature to pass the bond so that it can be on the June ballot. There really is no need to wait until November. I think people in California are ready to see the 30 years of deterioration on our freeways addressed. Uh, the 30 years of, of um, growth that's happening at our ports. So certainly at the port of entry, uh, we know that much is happening in Baja as far as the port of entry for ships uh, coming from China and coming from other places that we do trade with. But so much of it is what's here in California. So we feel, and that is part of what we are doing with Governor Lorde and his administration, is working on those specific issues, issues that will really address what's happening at the border, how to make those, um, I think uh, Governor Norda talked about 80 million crossings, which are legal crossings across the border, to make that easier for our economies because we have to address um, what's happening on either side. So I believe that the infrastructure bond will go a long way in really addressing many of the issues that are part of what's happening at the border. Much of what's happening is included in the infrastructure bond. Okay, thank Bob, you. If, if I might just in, interrupt, uh, uh, with all due respect to the venue here, uh, I talked a few hours ago with uh, uh, Speaker Fabian Nunez, and he expressed his uh, his. Uh, his uh, reasons for not being here and uh, I understood very well because he is working on this precise topic right now. Uh, I just told him that uh, I think that I might uh, promote a sanction uh, for his absence uh, and I told him if there is anything left over from these bond issues please don't forget our state okay? <laughs> but he is very much committed and I did want to say this before I forget, uh, forget about it. Very much committed to this uh, competitive, uh, borderless uh, innovation concept. He is right. well committed and he will be working with us together on this uh, and I'm very, very happy about that. Well, and with all due respect to uh, Baja California Governor, um, Fabian Nunez has enough problems on his plate that if you get any crumbs, you'll be very lucky <laughs> when, when the day is done. Um, Daniel Hill, uh, tell us why you chose Mexicali as a place to open a high-tech industrial park, and what impediments have you encountered in, in doing that? Um, let me start off by saying my background is in the semiconductor industry, and uh, for many years, myself and my uh, partners uh, were involved in transferring technology to Southeast Asia. 
as our industry grew over the last 20 years, we started off needing labor. We ended up needing lots of uh, capital and, and, and that sort of thing. And uh, we put all that growth in South Asia. And the reason we did is because the governments there were extremely friendly, wanted us to help give their people jobs. And um, as time passed, when we talked to them about incentives that we needed, tax reductions and so forth, uh, they welcomed that kind of thing with open arms. So we worked with um, Taiwan and Singapore and Malaysia, and later on China's rules were formulated after those. And um, after about 20 years, we started to set back as an industry and say, gosh, we've transferred almost everything to Asia. There's nothing left in advanced manufacturing. Now, we look at the Mikila Dora, what we have in Mexicali, and a lot of the manufacturing that's you know, here in San Diego and other parts of the United States, and, oh, we're doing a great job. But when we talk about it, really advanced manufacturing, semiconductors, flat panel displays, and those kinds of things, uh, it's, it's an altogether much more advanced process. If you pluck one human hair from your head and you split it, 100,000 times, that's the feature size we're using in factories. The factories cost $4 billion each. Half of the people are engineers. And all that capability is going to Asia. Uh, worse yet, if you look at any printed circuit board on your laptop, your cell phone, the control, that the airplane that you flew here, the air router, the telecommunications, have parts manufactured in Taiwan. Uh, if something happened in Taiwan, our whole industry was, would be in trouble. So we started looking for a way to bring that kind of capability back uh, for the region. And we started talking to the people in Baja, California, the governor, when he, after he first took his job. And they embraced us the same way that we had been embraced in, in uh, Asia years ago. And it, and it just snowballed into the federal government in Mexico. And most recently, now it's snowballing into the state of, uh, of California. So we're uh, extremely excited because we're able to put together incentive packages that compete with um, China and South Asia. Uh, we believe that with those incentive packages, the will of the government, of, of politicians, the talent that's available with uh, universities in Mexico and in California will be able to have an alternative to what we have in Asia. Thank you. Uh, Jesse Knight, uh, Daniel Hill, is obviously talking about a number of uh, companies that do business on both sides of the border. Uh, I suspect that was part of uh, his decision in, in going to Mexicali. But uh, you work with these companies a great deal. You see their problems. What, what are the, the prime uh, impediments to a company that operates on both sides of the border to expand and to prosper? Well, obviously, every company is looking for um, capital and also access to market, and most importantly, opportunities. And um, I think what we have here today is the foundation to be able to solve that as a problem. This is an effort of networking and reaching out. Uh, what, what's so beautiful about, I think, this uh, whole effort that Dialogue has embarked upon in the Mexico Business Center is educating people in the marketplace on both sides of the border of the opportunities to, to be able to leverage what they have built or what they want to build and to be able to bring those to realization here at the marketplace. And I think that that is probably one of the most important things that this kind of an exercise can do. Uh, I, I hope next year we have three times the number of people here. There is the uh, responsibility and I think the duty for all of us here to, if we, if we really take this seriously, this is essential to our survival, essential to our long-term health in a global economy. And the, the, the fundamentally here, we're trying to find opportunities for those companies to be able to expand what they do to, with their vendors, new companies, new markets, and what have you, and to uh, provide that environment for them to be able to, to flourish. Thank you. <clears throat> Elias Laniado. Uh, Governor Ehlert, we talked about uh, one region, one 
one huge uh, market, one great opportunity for economic development. Uh, this is not new to the dialogue, of course. In the, in, in the old days, Mary, I'm sure you remember this, and this was a phrase that I suspect Chuck Nathanson uh, created, but we used to try to talk about Tijuana as the other side of town. We tried to, to, to enforce that notion that we are one city. It never really has taken hold uh, on this side of the border, uh, outside of uh, those of you who are obviously doing business on both sides of the border. But I'd like to know what your agency is doing uh, to the extent uh, it's important to you to, to try to re, uh, reignite this notion that San Diego and Tijuana really are one economic region. Well, the economy driven this. Uh, San Diego economy is doing pretty good. Also, our region is doing pretty good. If we have the synergy together, we can imagine what we can do together. If we look to the uh, book of facts we made four years ago, on the cover says the San Diego Tijuana region. That's the only thing that says. As a matter of fact, we pay for it. <laughs> if you open the book, the, the first picture is the San Diego skyline, our best neighborhood, we said. <laughs> and thousands of those have been distributed along the world. Next week, the governor and what we call the Baja team, we're traveling to Asia for 15 days, promoting our state and our region. I believe you also should pay part of that trip. <laughs> I will come even when, when the check comes from the, from the video we're doing together. Uh, what I believe we need more businessmen involved in this. Now the institutions like the Mexico Business Standards, San Diego Dialogue, uh, the San Diego EDC are working with us. Also board members, Pete Garcia, Stad Caras, believers like Steve Williams, Malin Burham, they are already invested with us. We need more businessmen involved in our region on this side of the border. We are convinced we have to create the confidence to continue working on this region. Thank you. Uh, Julio de Quesada, a, a somewhat uh, offbeat question, but uh, Mexicans working in the United States send home 15 billion or more dollars a year in remittances. Uh, the state of Georgia recently uh, was considering legislation that would tax that money as it left the country. Uh, the idea has been discussed in Sacramento. Uh, what, what impact would that have uh, in terms of uh, the Mexican economy, if some share of those remittance, remittances, a very large amount of money, uh, got held on this side of the border? First of all, I think we should work towards more open flows of funds and more open flows of commerce, not, not the opposite. Uh, this would be going back in time. Uh, I think whoever proposed that uh, is not uh, aware of, of economic realities that are taking place in the world in the world today. Uh, Mexico received uh, last year 20 billion dollars of remittances uh, from the US uh, Mexican uh, workers. Uh, we estimate that this year should be about 26 billion dollars. It's, it's, it's a very important amount. What we have to understand is that these people are leaving in the US. 26 billion is only a portion of the value creation that these people have given. Uh, they have, I believe, probably more than twice as much given to the U.S. Uh, you know, in, in, in work. Um, I remember when Resolution 197 was passed in California that I was asked to give a talk at the, uh, the Institute of the Americas in La Jolla, and we did some uh, very extensive research on the value creation of Mexican workers in the U.S and what the U.S. gave back to them. And I can tell you there was a, uh, a surplus, uh, you know, on the, on the Mexican side. Uh, the, the, the contribution to uh, the U.S. economy of the Mexican worker is, is tremendous. These people are already taxed. Uh, these people contribute uh, hard work. They contribute uh, creativity. Mexican workers are extremely hardworking and very creative. So I think that people that, that propose uh, uh, things of this nature uh, you know, do not understand the reality of what's going on economically and, and socially. These people, as was, was mentioned by the governor, are a tremendous asset uh, to the United States. It's a society that has been built uh, you know, throughout time by, by immigrants. Uh, so to tax these people 
uh, not only is it extremely unfair, but does not recognize the fact that they are already uh, giving the U.S. a tremendous amount of, of, of value. I mean, th these are people that are the backbone of the construction industry in the U.S., they're the backbone of the restaurant industry, they're the service industry, and uh, if you don't recognize that, you don't understand economic reality. Thank you. Uh, we are just about to take questions, your questions. So if you would like to uh, step to the microphone here in the middle of the room, perhaps form a line if necessary, we'll get to you in, in just a moment. Uh, so I hope you have some questions for the panelists. Uh, Julio, the, the point that you just raised uh, stirs a, a number in my head that was just published last week by the Pew uh, Hispanic Center, which showed that today one in 20, or about 5% of um, the American workforce are illegal workers. Uh, in some industries, as you said, it's much higher. Uh, in in uh, drywall and sort of home construction, that kind of work, it's as high as 20, 25 percent. Um, I'm wondering, given again this uh, dichotomy between the reality on the ground and the debate in Washington about the 11 or 12 million illegal immigrants in the United States, uh, whether there's any realistic uh, uh, prospect that the, the, the United States could send these people home, which is the goal of a lot of the legislation. I mean, to, to basically tell 5% of your workforce, go home, uh, seems to be an economic disconnect. I, I don't know if you've seen the movie. There was a movie made in Mexico called A Day Without Mexicans. <laughs> uh, <Yes>. <laughs> <laughs> you would not be able to eat at restaurants. You would not have people do your gardening. You would not have a lot of industries thrive. You would pay about $15 per tomato. Uh, so, uh, you know, it, it's, it's unrealistic. It's unrealistic, uh, and, and, and this recent uh, proposal to make uh, um, immigrants, uh, illegal immigrants in the States, uh, um, criminally uh, responsible, I, th I think it's also very impractical. Uh, I think we have to work on a, um, a disciplined, but a, a very practical and official uh, guest worker program. I think that's the way to go with an element of amnesty for the people that are already working in the United States. Uh, if you do that, you will officialize it, you will officialize something that's a reality. You will have people on databases, which today are performing work, but they're not on any database. So if you talk about uh, uh, security, if you talk about anything of, of that nature, a guest worker program tied with a, with a reasonable amnesty program makes all the sense in the world. Okay, thank you. Yes. <clears throat> My name is Rodrigo Gutierrez and I'm the director of Centuries. And I guess what I want to do is a comment and have uh, the lady or the gentleman uh, substantiate this and whether you know, our belief is correct. And I think that the thing about uh, the integration of the border or borderless innovation is, is about numbers. And this reminds me, I don't know if you saw the movie uh, The Thomas Crown Affair uh, some, some years back. And they have all these little, these children running around in the, the museum and they're giving the tour. And the children are actually pretty bored, you know, looking at the paintings. But then the tour uh, master, you know, starts telling them about the painting by Monet. And, you know, they're still pretty bored. And he says, well, if it doesn't get your attention, that little picture is worth $35 million. And all of a sudden, you know, they got the attention. I guess what I'm trying to say that, you know, they talked about 50 million and 80 million border crossings, and the last study says that of all those crossings, each of those persons that cross the border leaves approximately between 125 and 175 dollars. So that's just the equivalent of one Qualcomm a year that is brought into the country. The other point is that uh, there are wonderful examples across the world of the border regions, as we see them here, that are doing incredible things. And I think Mary Walsh could give us a, a long uh, presentation of what's going on in Sweden, Finland, Norway, and the Baltic states. We'll save that for another day. Yeah, you, you must have the a point, question for the, the panel. The question is if we, they can substantiate the fact that it's, this, is, this is a matter of when are we going to get this whole project going, how fast we're going to do it. It's not a matter of whether we do it or not. 
it's a matter of how soon we start, and can the lady or the gentleman substantiate it, you know, is there the backing, can we really put it together as fast as we can? What Thank is you. the sense of urgency? Thank you. Yolanda Benson? Since I'm the lady, um, I'll be happy to answer that. I can tell you that uh, Governor Schwarzenegger and Governor Lorde are very good friends and have an incredible um, relationship. And through that, uh, through, through the governor's, both governor's leadership, we have already begun work groups with California, not only with other uh, government agencies, but we've involved the private sector as well as regional and local governments. Uh, we continue to do more outreach. One of the main projects we are working on right now is the silicon border uh, that Daniel has laid out for developing a 250-acre science park. So sometimes it takes a project like that to actually start working together to actually see all of the great synergies that we talked about earlier, how that, through that collaboration it can happen. So I can tell you that right now we are beginning to work on that. And we don't want to just uh, begin and end with the silicon border. We have obviously other great opportunities with our economies to not just work with Baja, but actually work into further, further into Mexico to try and create, again, those synergies that we've started already with the silicon border. So we have already started with that. Uh, our administration is working very closely with the Baja government right now. We plan to then take the next steps to not just work with Baja but other great economic opportunities. So we have started that already. Thank you. We are just about out of time. We'll let Jesse Knight have the last one. I, I just want to say I want to take a different a different uh, tact on that question because the answer isn't always with the government. The answer are, are with people who are willing to put up capital and do deals and do projects and take risk and put together ideas and projects on both sides of the border. So the, we're not going to turn to the, to the state government or the federal government for all of our answers. The opportunity here, as Elias alluded to, is all of us expanding our own networks on how we do business together and how we get involved in projects on both sides of the border. Capitalism is the answer to this. That's what's happening here in San Diego. We need to spread that model as wide and fast as we can. So it's not just starting now, it's already started. It's a dynamic process, and we're in the process of trying to, to infuse greater energy behind that by bringing more people into the circle to talk about the future opportunities. All right. Well, well, Governor Edward Dewey has to jump onto that. He's, yes. he's excited, so let's let him have the last word. Well, yes, uh, uh, Jesse was, was uh, very uh, pointed there in the, in the direction that the study says. I, I think that the study is very clear, and it shows that we must create a, a cross-border cross uh, uh, competitive and innovation center. And, and I would suggest that uh, we form a working group with the institutions here represented, not only the San Diego dialogue, but we have the San Diego Greater Regional Chamber of Commerce, we have the government of California, we have, in fact, uh, all different kinds of people that are related to this uh, motivation of opportunities. And, and this working group can set up a, 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 work, a way that would, this center could be created and, and, and work through this idea of looking at the opportunities and getting them together and putting them together so both sides can benefit from this great work that has been presented today. Absolutely. I would propose that. Absolutely. Well, on that note, I think uh, I should uh, just observe that this has been a very uh, insightful but also a very important uh, discussion, and I want to thank all of you for sharing your views with us. And now I will uh, uh, ask Mary Walshock to come back up to the microphone. Thank you all for joining us this morning and through lunch. And if you want to help, I think we've actually left forms on the chairs, and you can s tell us how you'd like to help. We will take you up on the challenge to build a collaborative approach to cross-border planning and visioning. And we'll continue to support Yolanda, Julio, everyone, thank you so much for your time and your candor. We are adjourned. <laughs>